Okay, so today we're going to uh, review for the final and to do that we're going to pick up with where I left off last time which was uh, going through these practice uh, final exam problems. Does anybody know where we stopped? Number six? Which one? Six? That's it, six, right? We did five? Did we do five? We did five, okay, so six. Okay, write a predicate function that checks whether a vector of integers but wait a minute, what's a predicate function? Returns true or false? Okay, that's it. That's what a predicate function is. <coughs> right, a predicate function that checks whether a vector of integers contains values that are in non-decreasing order. I thought we did this. We didn't do this one? A declaration of the function is shown in figure 5. Oh, that's here. There we go. So here's the predicate function. It's called is non-decreasing. And it because it's a predicate function, it returns bool, which is true or false. That's the data type, which is either true or false. A declaration here. The function returns true if the elements are in non-decreasing order. Otherwise, it returns false. For example, it will return true for v equals 3, 4, 4, 6, 8. By the way, that's, I gave that example because it's, it's not strictly increasing. So this is non-decreasing. So, so this is non-decreasing. It levels off here, but it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't decrease. And it will return false for three, four, six, two, five because you can see it's decreasing here. So I didn't want to call this increasing. You know, you can use the term, you could say that's increasing and differentiate between increasing and strictly increasing. Strictly increasing means you can't have any leveling. But to kind of avoid that confusion, I use the term non-decreasing. So this, is, this sequence is non-decreasing. It doesn't decrease. It can level here, but it can't go down, like here. So dropping from 6 to 2 is going down. All right, let's, let's go ahead and implement that. Actually, I have the, let me just open up the, there it is. We did this. Well, let's review. As you can see, the function that takes a vector, that's the function signature is given here. And so what it needs to do, it has to inspect every element. In fact, it needs to inspect every um, uh, adjacent pair of elements to make sure that uh, each, each element that has something following it, that the thing following it is, um, is not less than the thing that you're on. So, let's, let's, so, the, 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 so we need to range across the vector. And here, what we do, we're starting our index at zero. So we're looking at v of zero. That's the first item in the vector. So the condition there is that this first item has to be uh, larger than or equal to, actually, we get the wrong answer here, right? This is larger than or equal to. 
This is non-decreasing. That's that's incorrect. So so we can we should allow for that leveling that when two two items uh, match, v of zero v of i and v of i plus one can can be equal. Well, I'm sorry. This is uh, if non-decreasing. I got this wrong. This should be. Um, No, I got no, I had it right the first time, didn't I? Sorry, I had it right the first time. So if if an if an item that follows another is less that is smaller, then we know that it's non-decreasing, so we return false. I'm in a kind of a confused state right now. Okay, does everyone see that? So this condition here uh, I still got it wrong, didn't I? Yeah, this is this is when we return false. That's it. We better check this. Look at this vector here. Is that condition true or false? Is that condition true or false? Is V of I greater than V of I plus 1 for I equals 0 uh, in this vector right here? What's that? So this is, uh, this is false. So we don't return false. We continue on with the loop. All right, so then what we do is we look at each pair of numbers. Let's look at this example up here until we get to this, this final pair. And we check that, um, we check to see if the last item, which is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, if V of 4, which would be here, V of 4, we check to see if V of 4 is less than V of 3. And it's not, so we don't return false. And if we don't return false, then of course we, we exit the loop at that point, we return true, because we're terminating the loop when I is no longer less than size minus 1, which in this case would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, V of size is, in this example is 5, 5 minus 1 is 4. So when i is strictly less than 4, we continue with the loop. So when i is 3, we're okay. But when i hits 4, we've got to get out of there. So I, when i equals 3, that's the last index that we examine. So this would be index 0, 1, 2, 3. So 3 is the last index we examine. We compare it with index, with the element at index 4. So figuring out this, this limit and this expression, that's, that's part of the, the, the challenge of this problem. Now we could do this differently. Let's take a look at an alternative. We could do it like this. Instead of starting here, instead of taking this and comparing it to the next one, let's start here and compare it to the previous one. And then we end up at 8 and comparing 8 to the previous one. So we could do it differently, but we're still going to do the same number of comparisons. So we're going to do, we're going to compare these two pairs, that's 1, these two pairs, that's 2, these two pairs, that's 3, and these two pairs, that's 4. So we do 4 comparison, so the loop has to run four times in that case. So instead of starting at index zero, let's start at index one and finish at index four. We'll start at index one and finish at index four. So we want index 1 and we want index 4 which equals, which is um, V of size minus 1. So we could, put a, we could put an equal sign in there. 
or we could keep it as strictly less than and just get rid of the minus one. That's how you would normally see it. Although maybe the other way is easier to think about. So here now we're ranging across uh, the values in this particular case, um, index one to index four. <coughs> and then the comparison is going to be different. We're going to take is i, it should be non-decreasing. So we, ret we return false if it's decreasing. So if i is v of i is less than v of i minus 1, then it's decreasing. So some, for some i, for some position in the vector, the element there is less than the element that precedes it. So we know it's non-decreasing. I'm saying it's decreasing. It's not non-decreasing, so we return false. Any questions? Okay. I'm taking too long on that one. All right, how about this one here? Suppose that the array of in A has rows, rows, and calls, columns, where rows and calls are some constants. Implement a function that uses a loop nested inside another loop to add the value 3 to each element of the array. A declaration of the function is shown in figure 6. All right, let's try that one. So we have an array, a two-dimensional array. We need to add the value 3 to each element. And I even ex explain here to use a nested loop. It's actually possible use a loop nested inside another loop. It's actually possible to solve the problem without a nested loop. But I'm not going to go over that solution because we need to learn about nested loops. So let's let, uh, we need, we need a variable that's going to range across the rows. So let's use i for that. There's a variable i that ranges across the row indices. Now for each row index that we consider, We need to range across the columns. So let's let's create another variable called a j that's used to range across the columns. So there's a nested loop, and this loop inside this inner part of the loop, that's this is this is a spot that I at this point in the in this nested loop structure <coughs> that this that we will I at this point will have every possible value of I and J that's valid for A. So once we have it, then it's uh, it's straightforward. We just take um, the value at uh, I, a of i j, and we add three to it. All right, let's look at the next one. Implement the function declared in figure 7 so that it fills V with 100 distinct random numbers. 
Distinct means that a given number can appear at most once in V. Use the function rand to get random integers. So we have a vector V and uh, although it the problem doesn't say it, naturally it would, we would imagine that V would be empty although we could add that to this problem statement. So we have a vector V and we want to fill it with uh, 100 distinct random numbers. Maybe we can modify this. Assume that uh, V is empty. Assume that V is empty when the function is called. We could also assume that V had a, a hundred, a hundred slots, and then fill in those hundred slots. We could do it that way as well. It doesn't doesn't matter really. It's an artificial problem. So how are we going to? So that means we're, we've got an empty V. We need to use pushback to append a hundred things. So I'm just going to sketch out a solution. I mean, the beginning of a solution. That means we're gonna, we have to. We have to push we have to push a new value we're going to do something like let's see distinct uh, rand numbers right so we'll have something like this we generate a random number and then we push it on to v So, but that's not quite, quite there yet. Let's think about it. It's going to look something like that. We're going to get a random number value called value. Actually, let me let me make it easier, shorter. Let's call it n for n for number. We're going to get a random number and then we'll push it on to v. So, it'll, but it'll look the logic will look more like this. If um if if n is not already in v then add it to v and here is generate a random integer n And then here's the overall loop. So do do the following until V has 100 numbers. Has is, maybe contains is, is better. Do the following until V contains 100 numbers. What do we do? We generate random integer n and then we check to see if n <coughs> is not already in v then uh, and if it if it's not already in v then add it to v so it's kind of the rough outline there so means we're going to need a a while loop or a loop so while well v dot size is uh, less than a hundred. So keep doing this until we get a hundred numbers. This is easy. We generate the random number. But the hard thing is this test, right? So we're going to have a test. It'll look like this. Well, some, some, some test. If the test is true, then let's 
we test V, the admissibility of, uh, I'm sorry, of N. We test the admissibility of N. And if N is admissible, then let's, a let's uh, admit it. We do it like that. So how do we test if, um, but actually the test is complicated because we need to scan through V to see if N is in there. So that means we need a loop. We need to scan through V. So if V has, if v has 13 numbers in it, we need to check, you know, V of 0, V of 1, V of 2 to V of 12. And for each of those values, test to see if it's equal to N. And if it's, and if it's not equal to N, then Um, for each value, then we can add, then n is okay. So let's use a for loop. So we know exactly how many times we need to do the loop. And let's use our trusty i as an index. So let's let's scan through each of these. Then we have the test if if v of i is n. Then n cannot be used. Hard to get it in there. So if if we find n inside v for whatever size v uh, v currently is, then uh, then we can't use n. But if we if we complete this loop, this inner loop, see we're inside of another loop here. If we complete this loop, if we check if this condition fails for every index that's valid for V, then then we know N is good so we can push it onto the vector. But what do we do here if we if we see that that N can't be used, how do we get out of this? What do we do at this point? And one last line that needs to get inserted in there. What would you do? What's the secret word? Continue. continue. Yeah, continue. Exactly. Oh, wait a minute. No, it, it continue won't work. Because continue will continue the for loop. So continue means go to the start of your current, you know, the most, you know, immediate enclosing loop. Break. That's it. We got to break. But actually, break won't work either because then we're going to, although we'll probably break is going to be okay, but lick it, lick it here because when we break, we're going to push in. <laughs> so it's not going to work either. So we have to reorganize. Th this problem's not as easy as I thought. I mean, it's still, it's not that, not super tough, but it just takes some thought. So... <laughs> We can use the old trick. Huh? Well, yeah, I would try to avoid go to, but that would work. But the, the standard trick is to have a Boolean variable called something like found. And uh, we set it to... Because we have to verify that that's true for every possible i. Yeah, we, we can do inside the loop. If vi 
if not equal to n, we would put that. If vi is not equal to n, but you have to test it for every i. You have to test it for v of 0, v of 1, v of 2. Yeah, you can't do it for just one. Let's, let's use the standard trick. We'll assume that V is not in there. Okay, found is false. V, the, I'm sorry, N is not in there. Well, let's assume, start by assuming that N is not in V. And then let's go in there and try to find it. Find a spot. Oh, now we know that n is in there. Maybe found is not the right. No, I think found is okay. That's a standard name. So if we find it, we'll assume that we didn't find it. Then when we find it, we set found equal to true. And then we we don't you don't have to do this. We could check the other numbers in the loop, but you know, and this is optional. It's just more efficient. We could check the other numbers in the loop. It's just that we've already found one, so we don't need to check any more. But uh, so we could we could break this for loop, uh, but um, that doesn't that's not necessary for correctness. It's only needed for efficiency. Then we need to test if if n is not found, then we can push n onto v. And see, each time we push a value onto v, v of size grows. It gets one larger. So we keep doing this. See, sometimes when we, when we generate n at this point, uh, you know, it may be a bad n. It may be an n that's already in v. So, you know, we, we, can't, we, we, we end up not pushing it. So in this outer loop, this while loop, doesn't, we don't know how many times the loop is going to run. Because we don't know how many times we're going to randomly, we're going to generate a random number that's already in the vector. Any questions on this one? Any more questions? Yeah. No? no? But that's the standard trick, right? We've, we've actually used this already in this class. Setting a Boolean variable called found, something like found to false, and then seeing if we find it. All right, let's go. All right, let's look at this rectangle class. So we have a rectangle class here, and then here's the question. Write a triangle class that resembles the rectangle class in figure eight. The triangle class should have private member variables and appropriately designed constructor plot and move functions. All right, let's do it. So we have this rectangle class as a as a model. So we're going to build a new class here. Actually this um, So the triangle class is going to have a constructor. Now look at the rectangle class constructor. We have 
points, two points. But with the triangle class, we'll need three points. Call it something like A, B, and C. And when those points come in, I'm going to just drop down here. When those points come in, we need to s we need to preserve those. Do it like this. It's the same with the rectangle class. When these when these uh, upper left and, and lower right points come in, uh, that becomes our our internal data that we preserve. That's normally the case. It's not always, but uh, normally the case. Um, that when you create an instance of a class, you pass in the data that will be used to initialize the, 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 the object state. Let's go ahead and implement the, the constructor. And uh, so if we look at the constructor, and there's many different ways to do this. And um, this constructor. And I want to show you, um, I'll show you what maybe, uh, most students think this is the simple way. I'll show this to you. This would be something like, call that A in, B in, a C in. That's one, that's the way that uh, one day I took a vote in here and people seem to think that was the easiest form of the constructor to understand. You Notice these are just placeholders here. This is just documentation. This A has no effect on the program. In fact, if I took that out, this program would still compile. Compiler does, it just ignores that. That's just for documentation. But down here, these are required names because we need to use those when we implement the constructor. <coughs> and this name here and this name here, because this is optional, they, they don't need to match. What needs to match is the type of arguments that are passed in. The triangle constructor, this one, takes three points. So whatever we're going to call them down here, which doesn't matter, it has to be three points. All right, let's go back to the problem statement. The triangle class should have private member variables. We did that. An appropriately designed constructor, we did that. A plot and move functions, let's do that. Plot and move functions. Notice this problem is 20 points. So I made up one of these problems on the final already, and it's 20 points, just similar to this. It's not the same problem, though. <coughs> let's see the plot and move functions. So let's take a look at that. This is plot. Remember, when we call a plot, we just draw the thing. We don't modify the internal state of the class. But when we move, we do modify the internal state of the class. So dx and dy are double precision floating point numbers, which um, represent the amount that needs that the triangle needs to move in the x and y directions. 
let's go ahead. Now that move function is going to modify the state of the object and so we, we do not declare that as constant. This is constant. So let's do this. So triangle Let's do the um, let's do the uh, the plot function. So the plot function is going to be drawing three lines. It's similar to rectangle. Let's take a look at the rectangle. Here's the plot function for the rectangle class. We're drawing four lines. We, in order to draw these lines, we needed to construct two more points. Because we have the upper left, we have the lower right, but we don't have the upper right and the lower left, which are needed for the four lines. But in the case of the triangle class, we don't need to construct any more points. We need the line from A to B. And the line from B to C. And the line from C to A. There's the plot function. And now the uh, move function. Let's go ahead and implement the move function. So, you know, the only thing that this class does is it draws itself. And it draws itself based on the values of A, B, and C. So, to move this, we want to, when we move the, in the object, this triangle object, we want it to draw in a new position. So what we do is we need to move those three points that are used to perform the draw operation. We just call move on those three points. Is it that how we did it in the uh, rectangle? Yeah. <coughs> and that's it. That's it for the for the review as well. Um, well, we can look at new problems if you want, but that's that's it. You know, these these problems that I posted here that we've looked at already are based on the new material since the midterm. But uh, some of the problems that appeared on the midterm, I'm reusing those for the final as well. So you also need to go back and review those midterm style problems. Your question? Um, questions? There are nine questions. Each question is worth 10 points except the last question. The last question is worth 20 points. And the last question looks like this class problem that we just looked at. But most of the questions have you implementing a function. There's a few questions where I ask you to state what, when the code runs, what does it display or what does it print? That would, that would be similar to the, to the midterm. When, when the code in figure one runs, what does it output to the console? So that's, a, that's another type of question that appears on the final.
Any want to do anything else? By the way, that um, the tic-tac-toe problem I finished in my office and recorded that. And um, we could look at that if you like. Unless you want to skip that. It, that, that problem still could use some cleaning up and also we could discuss the, the structure of the program. You know, could, there's, there's different ways to organize the code. There's different ways to define that tic-tac-toe class and how to call it from main. You know, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, variations and um, possible simplifications that we could do to make that code um, cleaner. Any suggestions? We could just quit. No? Do you want me to, in, you want to try some new problems that are going to resemble the final exam problems? You want to try that? Okay. Let me throw, let's throw out a problem and then maybe what we'll do is I'll, you, you'll try to solve it and then, uh, and then we'll discuss it. Let's go ahead and do that. Let's do, um, Let's do this. What does the following code print? Say we have some some integer n. Set it equal to eighty eight. Well I well, n is greater than zero. Maybe something like k equals k um, plus n, n equals n divided by 2. Say, well, n is greater than 2. Maybe that's too hard. I make this um, 12. What is that? What does that code print? <coughs> Tell me when you get an answer. No, you, you got to do this one. And this <laughs> is uh, something like this will be on the final for sure. So test yourself now. I think you might need some pencil, right? Or a pen and make some notes. Is the number too big? Is it reasonable? Anybody have an answer? 21? I need I need someone else's vote. Twenty-five. 
25. Anybody get a different number? Or, or do you agree with one of these? Twenty four, twenty four, twenty four, twenty four. 24, 24, 24. How can I do a strike through? At this point, I would guess it's twenty four. But I wouldn't. I didn't do it. Huh? Twenty? Twenty-five. Did it, someone else say twenty-five? Was that your twenty-five? Huh? We have two votes for twenty-five and one and three votes for twenty-four. Now, now I'm not so sure it's twenty-four anymore. Huh? 24? Uh-oh, I think it's 24. Uh, back there, yeah? 24? It's getting safer to guess 24, to go with 24. I'm going to put my money on 24. Let's figure it out. Let's see. Well, I'll analyze it just in my head and talk out loud, but I think let's see if we can understand it. So, so we have these two variables, n and k. And we need to keep track of, you know, what they what they're equal to. So that's my little scribbling on the side of the on the final there. And uh so while n is greater than 2, uh, do this. So let's take k, whatever k, k is 3, and let's take um, uh, 3 plus 12, which is 15. 3 plus 12 is 15 and stored into k. So k is 15. And then we're going to take n, which is 12, and divide by 2 and store it in, store it in n. So that's n becomes 6. And then we're going to come up to the while loop here. And then we evaluate the condition. Is the condition true? I'll do the loop again. If the condition is false, we're done with the loop. Is n greater than 2? Yes, it is. OK, so let's continue with the loop. k equals k plus n. Well, k is 15, n is 6, that's 21. So we store 21 in k. And then we do the next line. We take n, which is 6, divided by 2, we get 3, stored in n. And we're at the bottom of the loop, which means we've got to go back to the top of the loop and evaluate the condition. Compare n, which is 3, to 2. Is 3 bigger than 2? It is. The condition is true. Let's do the loop again. Take k plus n. k is 21. Add n, which is 3. So that's 24 stored in k. k is now 24. Now let's take n divided by 2. That's 3 divided by 2. Oh, this is the tricky part. That's an integer division, right? Because the 2 is an integer. n is an integer. So that means we truncate. We drop the fractional part. So 3 divided by 2 is 1. So n is now 1. We come back to the top of the loop, evaluate the condition. Is 1 bigger than 2? No, 1 is not bigger than 2. So we exit the loop. We do the line following the loop. We print k, that's 24. There it is.
you know, when I grade the exams, you know, I'll see people answering that question, you know, all the same way. And I'm tempted just to say, oh, that's the answer. It must be 24. I'll just grade on that. But I always force myself to go through and calculate the answer. Okay, so let's do another one. <coughs> you want a, a, a function implementation problem to work on? Okay, that, you know, there's a function that takes an array or a function that takes a vector. Those are the two kinds of functions. Here's a function. Let's do this. Let's, um, write a function that inserts a value k in the first position of a vector and um, pushing back pushing back by one position the existing elements in the vector. And maybe I would give a function signature like this. So it's a vector v and an integer k. Maybe I would give it an example like this. Here's an example. If v were to be 3, 11, 99, and k is uh, 4, then after calling after calling the function v would equal four three eleven ninety nine. We just insert something in the front. Do you want to try it? Or should I just show it to you? So what we need to do is um, you know, how do we need to increase the size of the vector? And uh, we can do that using pushback. <coughs> Is there a push front? There isn't, right, for vectors. There's no push front. There's only a push back. Huh? There's pop back. You can pull, you can remove something from the back or push something onto the back, but you can't. What we want to do here is like do push front. In fact, let's call it, let's rename this. Call it push front. So, you know, 
let's if we had this vector here let's just think about it if this is the vector that we have then we're going to add us we're going to push something onto the back and then we have to shift everything over Then we're going to copy 99 into there. Then we'll copy 11 into here. Then we'll copy 3 into here. And then we'll copy 4 into the first slot. So we add a slot and then we start at the back and we we, we copy, you know, 99 into there, then we copy this 11 into here, then we copy this, uh, this 3 into here, and then we, cop then we insert the 4. So we're going to need to, uh, to do the insert, or the pushback rather. Once again, we, we don't know what to put in there. And uh, maybe we don't start at zero. We'll start, we'll start somewhere. We'll go, well, well i is um, greater than or equal to zero. Do it like that. So remember this slot, if the size of the vector is size v, I mean, sorry, if the size of vector is, is v dot size, then the, the index of the last slot is, is v dot size minus 1. So that's where we should start. So we start at, in the last index. We could either start there or we could start at v, s v size minus 2. I, you know, I don't know which one. So we can either point the index here and range it until it hits there. Or we start with the index here and, uh, and range it till it hits here. So this means this would be, I would have to be strictly greater than 0. So here we're setting i. We're starting at the end. We added a slot. Now we need to fill the slot in. We'll fill the slot in with the element that precedes um, that slot. And we'll do that until i becomes 0. And when i becomes 0, we have v of i. We can't use i 0 here because v of i is, would be v of 0, but this would be v of minus 1. That doesn't exist. There's nothing, there's nothing before v of 0 to copy into v of 0. You know, but v of 0 is, we know what goes in v of 0. That's k. That's just another example. Any questions on that one? You know, you, you need to work these out on your own. Yeah, I recommend taking those, all the problems, the midterm problems and the final problems that I gave, and toss away the answers. I mean, we'll hide away the answers and go through them and try to solve them on your own, and then, uh, and then check your solutions, because you have to practice. Because what you'll see on the final are new questions. They're very similar to these questions that we looked at. So you'll have to go through the analysis that we, toge that we did together in class, or at least that I did. You'll have to go through that analysis to solve those problems. You can't just m memorize uh, the specific problems that we're looking at here. Any other comments?
suggestion? No? Okay, I think that's it then. <laughs>